Greetings. Today I will summarize and review Boom 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 by Ian Kirkpatrick. Spoilers ahead. Boom 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 gives us a glimpse into the life of a YouTuber named John Bagan. When we are first introduced to him, it is clear that we are in the mind of a genius or an expert in the explosives field. He casually notices the oil content in the loading area at his workplace and notes how it could be set off. This also lets us know that he is passionate and is always thinking of his hobby, creating explosions. He records his explosions and posts them to YouTube to 22 subscribers. He doesn't get much views, but he still creates anyways. The book describes him driving on a moped through a very small town where only one grocery store exists and snow and trees are plenty. He goes home and uploads his videos and tells his friend Alex, who doesn't seem to care, but is still supportive of his friend's hobby, if that makes any sense. Chan's ingredients for explosives are uh, described as being in recycled cans and bottles, and in organized boxes with a precaution to keep them away from each other in the room. This sets up the norm, and even mundaneness of Jan's life. He works, he rushes over to his usual spot to make a video, returns home and uploads his video, something others can relate to in some degree. Having work or school, using what little time you have left to do something you want, whether it be video games, a hobby, or hanging out with friends, then going to bed. One day, things change. None other than Bob Dylan and Tom Cruise show up to John's house. I think that I'm Tom Cruise! I want Bob Dylan up on stage! And they want to sponsor John. They offer him ingredients. When he has, once he has, once he has never seen or dreamed of having before. John takes the sponsorship. And he's giddy to meet true blue fans of his. He's finally getting the recognition he deserves. And the new ingredients come in nice labeled containers and a nice metal suitcase. This contrasts John's makeshift storage of his ingredients. So John takes some of the new ingredients and sets off to make another video. One thing to mention, he has a form of synthesthesia. He tastes or smells the ingredients and the sensations give him allow him. And the sensations he gets from the taste or smell allow him to determine what effect they will have when added together. This reminds me of the guy who can calculate big complicated numbers in his head because he visualizes his numbers as shapes and adds them together to get the answer that is almost equal to the speed of a calculator. This talent, Jan makes another explosive concoction, one bigger than he's ever made, one with vibrant colors that changes the color of the sky, a brilliant display of light, and his video goes big, a whole 200 views, and he even gets a comment, cool vid from someone called not the Eggman 671 John's phone blows up with messages from Alex. He is asking Jen if he knows what's going on. He's worried and explains how Russia is getting all uppity at Ukraine. John alludes to his new sponsors, but the conversation is cut short. As Jen goes out, there are Russian vehicles and soldiers everywhere. John goes into the town's bakery. It is packed with big Russian soldiers. He goes to his work. There are Russian soldiers. But throughout all of this, Jen tries to be friendly and recommends the town's bakery to them. Jen is brought into the office of his boss, and he tells John to quit his videos for a bit. It's obvious to both him and the viewer that the explosions he caused has caused this incident. And it's also explained that whenever the Russians came, they would eventually leave. So if Jen cools it with the explosions, it should just blow over. Jen goes back to his usual spot, but there are Russians there. After a confrontation, Jen leaves, but something lingers, that 200 views. Jen wants to keep that ball rolling. He could get even more views with another video. So he finds another spot and mixes the new ingredients together again. But this time the explosion goes off too soon, and Jen is caught in the explosion. The glass from the jar he uses cutting into him, the explosion itself rivaling the one from before. Jen is lucky that he has his moped as he is messed up now. He stumbles into his home to a worried family. He tries to play it off but can barely walk and is going in and out of consciousness. He is in the bathroom and his father tends to his wounds. Jan wakes up. Even more messages from Alex. His mother comes in worried and his father reprimands him. Jan doesn't want to tell him where he was or what he was doing the last night but it's obvious and you can't really play off coming back home bloodied and beaten. But Jan's mother tells him that the sponsors are here again. John walks down the hall, stumbling and is fighting for consciousness, but he meets with the sponsors in the living room again, and they seem to be wearing the same clothes as before, 
Hawaiian shirts and sunglasses that hide their eyes. They offered Jan to come to America to have his own show funded by investors. Jan doesn't want to leave his home, but he thinks of making money in America and eventually moving his family out. He accepts. He says his goodbyes to his mother and packs some items to go to. But his father confronts him, calling up a terrorist and disavowing his actions as something no son of his would do. Jan walks around him and leaves. One thing here is that I think there should have been more of a struggle. I wish Jan's dad would have blocked the door or grabbed his arm, making Jan's rather quick decision to go to America that much more of a bridge being crossed. Jan does not have a passport, but the sponsors say that they have it covered. Jan is on a private jet. He tries to text Alex, but is told to put his phone away, lest he make the plane crash. Jan goes into the bathroom and texts Alex in secret, but gets no response. He comes back out. The sponsors are simply playing cards on their phones or drinking. Patrick Bateman even makes a cameo. They land in America, and Jan is warned of how rabid fans can be. They will be happy to see him, yes, but some may be crazy and want to kill him, to be eternally connected to him in a sense. In the airport, many people mechanically chant, Bill, 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 in science, and say Jan's name, uh, Jan's channel name, Jananananana. But it had too many na na and it sounds like they're singing the Batman theme. Some are elbowed to chant more or act enthused, and they split apart when the sponsors motion to. But one stands out, a blue-haired babe with pink streaks in her hair. She bumps into the sponsors and calls them glowies. Jan is enchanted by her. He even thinks of marrying her, and she mouths, run. Jan is put in a car with his uh, personal assistant, Bill Cosby who also wears a Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses that block his eyes. Jan is mesmerized by America and notes to architecture, looking Roman and modern and having classical buildings. But Jan wonders why they're in Washington, D.C. He thought he would be going to L.A., and this is when Bill Cosby messes up. They are driving across a bridge and in heavy traffic, and Bill Cosby says that only officials should be allowed to use the bridge, which is weird because Bill Cosby is a rapist and not a government official. John is taken into a luxurious hotel. Bill shows him his room and even gifts John a laptop to, for his YouTube. He tells John that they have some big meeting with investors coming up, so he should rest up. John is taken down and into a convention room, rows filled with military men. John is given the fancy new ingredients again and is told to make something small to show them uh, his skills. John does so, but is nervous. He's never done this in front of a crowd before. He usually uses vodka to cleanse his palate when tasting ingredients, but here it's clear he is drinking more due to nervousness. John makes the explosion, and the plastic container it is in melted and rains down on the first couple of rows, which I may add is a nasty thing. I think prisoners will melt a chocolate bar wrapper and all to use it as a weapon. Melted plastic is a nasty thing. One of the military men, who Jen calls a military cosplayer, and Jan notes that all the cosplayers are older than he thought his fans would be. And the one that comes up is all angry. But Bill com tries to calm him down and shows the conference room a video of Jan's bigger, more impressive explosions. Jan is taken back to his room and he looks outside the door. A man in a hotel uniform stands guard there all day. Jan says he wants to leave to get some ice. The hotel worker says he'll get it and does so. Hmm. Jan tries to text Alex some more, but he gets no response. He hopes he isn't mad at him. He tries to send him footage of the explosion at the convention, but it's not on his phone. Bill Cosby then takes Jan to the studio, one called the Pentagon. Jan even sees uh, famous actors Daniel Craig and Scarlett Johansson, so it must be a good studio. Jan tries to soak in the scenery, the statues or plaques on the walls, but is pulled to his destination, a big white room with a box in a corner for him to make videos. This seems like a controlled environment, one where he can make all the explosions he wants without a risk to anyone. Jan looks at his YouTube and now has millions of subscribers. They mentioned that the internet here shows all the subscribers that were hidden to him. This should be a moment of glory for Jan, but it's not. He goes live, but the count of millions of viewers means nothing. They aren't truly there. He doesn't feel them, but he has Bill Cosby. But Jan can't connect with them since he can't see his eyes. Ben drank half a bottle of vodka, and I forget if he makes this explosion or not. 
This could be me being stupid and forgetting what happened since I have holes in my brain. So read the book for yourself and pick up what I had missed or misrepresent. Anyways, he returns to the hotel room and they say that he will get a mansion soon, but the hotel will have to settle for now. Jan sits in his room uneasy. He opens the door. The hotel worker is still there. He closes the door. And my boy starts tweaking. He picks up a chair and chucks it at the window. The glass does not break. Jan strips and goes to the shower, tossing his phone in the sink. Bill and the hotel worker come in and ask what happened. Jan says he doesn't know. They say they heard a sound. Uh, sound. Jan says he doesn't know, but they are suspicious. Jan wants food and to go to a restaurant. They say not to worry and that he'll get food. Jan has no say in what he gets, and Bill leaves. Jan starts tweaking again. He opens up the wiring of a lamp and messes with it, using his knowledge to have a burst of flames. Uh, Bill comes in again and asks if Jan did this. Jan says no, but Bill persists. So Bill drags Jan down the lobby and outside into a car. Bill is going to bring Jan somewhere safer from the people uh, they say are crazy for Jan and that he needs to be protected from. But Jan hears Bill speak Russian, so Jan runs. He runs so far, weaving through streets and homes, hiding under a car until he thinks it's safe and keeps going. He goes into a neighborhood where the blue and pink-haired babe is present. Jan at this point is wearing the same clothes as the sponsors, a Hawaiian shirt, but no sunglasses. She calls him a glowy, but Jan doesn't know what that is. She is dismissive, but Jan persists, and he shows her his channel, but it does not have millions as he claims, but only 22. Knowing Jan is being hunted, she gives him a change of clothes and they go to a club to speak with the cover of sound. She tells him her name, Blake. She tells him her father is a news anchor that rails against the government, but is on the news so it doesn't count. She talks about how the government is composed of people who are so base that they only care about a few things that make them not care about who or what they have to destroy to gain power. She tells him why they are called Chloe's, and she thinks she spots them in the club, so they dance to blend in. They smooch and run, getting another hotel to lay low at. Jan is infatuated with her. He loves her scent and cute face. He loves when they hold hands. She now is to go on her father's show and have Jan tell a story. It won't cause a huge incident, but it'll be enough for the government to let Jan go home to avoid a further incident as Jan has no passport to get home and has also lost his phone at this point. As they head to her dad, she tells Jan how to spot a glowy. She goes up to a homeless person wearing sunglasses that hides his eyes, and he sits up. I'm looking for the blue M30s. People call them the perks, but I believe they're fentanyl. <laughs> anyway, I'll be here. I'm a homeless man. Hi, excuse me, boss. Hey. Now, the book makes him go into a verbose backstory which is a way to identify liars. They give us lots of unnecessary, intricate detail to make their story sound believable. She shows how they are unable to make human connection, hence why they glow in the dark. They stand out so much. They are in a sea of people heading to the news station, and Jan bumps into a guy who kind of looks like his friend Alex, because it is Alex. The other thing I want to criticize is how Jan meets Blake and Alex. He gets lucky. Blake just happens to be outside when Jan is in the neighborhood, and they somehow bump into Alex, who just knows Jen is in America, not where. For Blake, I thought of Jen reaching a really low point. He has no money or ID in a foreign country, so he has to beg. He thought he'd be rich and famous, and he ends up homeless. And then Blake would end up coming up to him and calling him a glowy because of how he's dressed. But when she looks up his channel, she knows he's the real deal. I also would have liked for Blake to be not the Eggman671, the one who gave the nice comment. And this is how she recognizes him from his channel. And why was Blake at the airport when she bumped into Jan's handlers? If she, if she was not the Eggman 671, she would have known Jan was in uh, deep, seeing the new military grade ingredients, and how he mentioned sponsors. That would tip her off to try and uh, help him escape by mouthing for him to run. Or she could have bumped into Jan and shoved a note to him telling him to meet up with her somewhere. But I suspect the handlers would have noticed the note. So I think this could have been done differently than just chance. I don't even know how Alex would have found them, as Blake even mentions that they'd be monitoring messages to Ukraine. Maybe Alex could have heard gossip about the convention, where someone drank half a bottle of vodka and set off an explosion and knew Jan was near. Anyways, the three of them convene at a coffee shop and are on their toes, startled whenever someone walks by the window or enters the shop. They compare notes, Alex being a better source for Blake to understand what happened with Jen, 
But the barista approaches, and he is big, and is wearing no shirt under his apron. Blake flips the table onto him, and they run, splitting up, sitting to meet up later. John runs into a mall and hides in a convenience store. He opens up a hair dye kit. At first, I thought he was going to dye his hair a different color to throw off the pursuers. But he uses the chemicals, along with other chemicals in the store, to make an explosive. But as he's mixing, a pursuer comes into the store and sees John, and a clerk also comes into the mix. But John finishes the explosive and throws at the pursuer and runs through the back doors. John thinks of the gases that one might inhale from an explosive, and I'd like to mention that he even used ammonia. And the way he threw at the guy, I wouldn't be surprised if he killed him. Luckily, it isn't stated, and I'm glad. John is a very well-meaning guy, and have to have him kill someone would have been a very dark term. John runs out, but it's caught. A gun is pulled on him. He's knocked out and wakes up, gagged, and tied to a chair. Russians. They call him a terrorist and insinuate that he's working with the U.S. to bomb the border of Russia and Ukraine. Jan, Jan insists he didn't, and they slap him around. But Jan and the others convince the Russians that he truly didn't intend any malice. And Jan even states that he hopes Russia and Ukraine can be amendable to each other, and that they are like brothers. They fight but are still together. I would like to mention that this book was made before the conflict of Russia and Ukraine, so chillax. It is more of a generalized conflict anyways, like how you can have a Russia and U.S. fight, but that's not really what the story is about. For example, you can have a spy story where the villain and heroes being one side or the other act as a thematic element. This book could have been about an American meeting of Russian celebrities which sponsor him and fly him to Ukraine to make videos there. The same themes of government manipulation of an innocent person being there. Anywho, they agree to help John get back to Ukraine so long as the, he makes an explosion for them. John wasn't, doesn't want to do this, but he doesn't really have a choice. So the three are in front of the Abe Lincoln Memori Memorial, and Jan fires up a stream. With Blake manning the camera, I forgot to mention, Jan now has millions of actual subscribers. Alex shared Jan's channel through enough Russian circles to have it get big. The plan is to have Jan speak his story on his channel instead of the uh, TV now. Jan sets off an explosion, but it's not a really destructive one. Fireworks, really. And the Russians set off similar fireworks around the area. Bill Cosby shows up, along with more glowies. But the Russians are there too. Jan puts his hands up and tells Bill not to shoot him. But Bill says he isn't. But Jan persists. Jan says he's going home. But Bill says no. That why would he want to run away? That Jan at this point is tired of this. Why would they use him? For more power? Why do they need that power? To make some money off a of proxy war? And the hypocrisy. How John making bombs for the U.S. is okay, but him setting off fireworks at the memorial is not. This all comes to a head when Bill calls Ukraine a communist country. Jan says it wasn't or never was, and Bill calls Ukraine shit all, which has, he has been doing for a while now, and now Jan finally calls him out for it. Bill insists that communism is a cancer. Even if you get uh, better, it persists in the body and can reemerge. Blake says that if that is the case, then what was the Red Scare about? Communists infiltrating positions of power in the U.S. So that same cancer should reemerge here. And that Bill and the Glowies are that cancer. He calls them dumb or something, but they tell him their life. And if he makes the wrong move, it'll cause an international incident. So Bill and the Glowies line up and walk into their black cars and drive off. Donna and Alex are ready to return to Ukraine. And Blake comes with. She's probably going to be hunted by the Glowies. So she thinks to go with them for now. And finally, they arrive back at Jan's home. He lovingly embraces his mother and even father. Jan introduces him to Blake, and Jan shows her around, and even brings her out to record a video. Jan makes a beautiful explosion with his own materials, one that's blue and pink. Jan and Blake get close. Do they kiss? Read the book and find out. Here's some of my thoughts. Again, I would have liked for Blake to have been not the Eggman, showing how she was there from the start. Because she doesn't even appear until way later in the book, otherwise. And she's on the cover too, so that Ed presence could have helped. But hey, that's just my opinion. The only reason I thought of that critique is because I had to. Usually I am a dummy, but while reading I had my thinking cap on. and was thinking of what to say in this video. The story is engaging and funny, with many good lines I didn't mention. The setting of a more modern area with a main character being a YouTuber is something that could have been done poorly if in the wrong hands. 
Most stories like that have the main characters channel rap being an instant hit, but this shows how sometimes your videos are just screams in the void. But again, how they aren't. 22 views? Hey, 22 people saw something you wanted to share. That's cool. John being so underrated even adds to the plot, letting us know something is up, as you need way more subscribers or viewers to get a sponsorship. And this story even made me hate John for a moment, uh, which I think is good. This book got a genuine emotional response from me that wasn't cheap. John was motivated by views to make another video, which heightened tensions between Russia and Ukraine. I hated that, but I understood his motivation. This shows how John cares about his YouTuber hobby to a fault. The story is comical. The Glowies all wearing those sunglasses, and even the homeless guy in hot dog feeder. Uh, first, one may think it's stupid, but I think it adds to John's obliviousness. Having uh, me, the reader, catch on to something that John didn't can add more suspense, or have that effect of watching a horror movie and wanting to scream the right uh, decision at the character. There's also themes of uh, the devil. But Blake even calls them as such. And if you're not religious, this theme can also be applied. Someone who wants to corrupt you doesn't offer you something bad. They entice you, offer you something you want. John wanted fame, so he left behind his family. Even at the beginning, whenever the sponsors wanted to talk, they would ask his mother to leave so they could manipulate him without her influence. And spur of the moment, uh, now or never types of deals tend to screw you over in some way. So they give you a little time to go over the details and fine print. Jean means well, and this parallels how guns were made. A Chinese man found how to make fireworks and use them as a toy, but then explorers came over and used the gunpowder to make guns, a far cry from what the intended use was. Another thing I wanted to mention is Jean's messages not being sent to Alex or his family when he was in the US. I watch travel videos and people will pack SIM cards for other countries so they have service when they are there. And I don't, I don't recall if they do that for service or just better service with the new SIM. And I don't doubt they could have just blocked John's service as they were able to delete files off his phone so it isn't that big a stretch. The book also goes into hating when governments manipulate people for their own gain and dips into the term Chloe. Now, from my understanding, the term comes from Terry A. Davis, who calls him glow-in-the-dark CIA cattle. It goes into how they are all wearing the same thing and not even trying to hide it, or their speech patterns, like how some undercover cop wanting to catch a drug dealer will say the legal name of a drug so that they can confirm that they are selling that drug instead of having the plausible deniability of selling grass or oregano. It also goes into how communists infiltrated everything. How many times have you opened up a video, and how long does it take for them to mention how much they hate capitalism, or blame something on capitalism, or call something bourgeois? People openly wear the symbol of book burners, and it's somehow normal. I'm not going to go too much into it, but whenever you see a dumb article, one like how cleaning your windows is racist, something really dumb like that, it's probably coded for Marxism. But idiots just call whoever wrote it an idiot and not realize who the article is meant for, or what it truly means. Anyways, this book is too unrealistic, because it does have to fall back on the trope of being satire and over the top. I mean, come on, all being undercover, all wearing the same uniform, you'd think people would notice that, right? Right? Hey guys, just a couple things, like, first off, is anybody else concerned about the lack of diversity? You know how we all, like, look and dress the same, and we're all white guys? Uh, if everybody that we like is identical to us, I don't, I mean, I... I don't know how to say this exactly, but like, is anybody else worried that we might we might be the bad guys? Like, maybe I'm way off here, but I feel like if we're going to march through the streets wearing disguises with, with a sign that says reclaim place name, does anybody else feel like I might have some historical vibes that are just like, you know, like just a little uh, evil? And then the other thing is the drums. Does anybody else feel like the drums are like somewhere between cringe and warmonger? Is that what we're going for? Are we, are we going for warmonger cringe? 